Hello, Winchester. Welcome to Visual Radio. The views and opinions on Visual Radio, those are the host and his guests, Robert K. Elder and Frank Delastrito, both book authors, of course. And not necessarily those of the WinCam Board of Directors, its staff, its management members, people of Winchester. Hello. Hey, you know, um, if you were just watching, if you were just watching our own Judy Kellerman, taped that Mahoney's Indoor Winter's Farmer's Market. Now that is a novel idea because people love these farmer's markets, but a Winter's Indoor Farmer's Market, and Judy did what I like people doing, which is videotaping these events and getting the word out on public access TV. Now uh, my guest is Robert K. Elder, but before him, we're gonna call Johnny Byers. If he's in, if he's in, he's watching the games, but there's no game on tonight. If he's not in, we won't talk to him. That is the right number, and he just called me back here. So, okay, John will call back if he wants to. We've got three minutes before I talk to my other guest. Now, the big news today, of course, is that TV3 Medford, that you've had to listen to us for three years now yapping about TV3 Medford. We've been fighting the good fight, and as of September 30th, it just hit the newspapers today. It hit the patch, it hit the Medford transcript. The board of directors of Medford Community Cable Vision Inc. voted to shut down. It's over. Our years of fighting up at the city council means that there will be a brand new public access station in Medford. Now what the mayor's gonna do, he's gonna allow the educational channel to interview the candidates because guess who's been yelling at the city council about allowing the candidates airtime. That's right, yours truly. So the mayor is listening and I talked to Martha Coakley. Thank you, Martha. If you've got Verizon, Martha Coakley might be watching tonight. Thank you, Martha Coakley. I met her at Dempsey's. She was very nice to me, come over, shook my hand. And I said, how can we, get you on public access when there is no access. She goes, I heard about that. We're going to look into it. Well, it's about two weeks later. I think Martha Coakley did look into it. I think she called her good friend, Mayor McGlynn. And here we are today. Very excited. Very happy. It looks like a new, a new dawn for Medford, which is a good thing. So let's try John Byers one more time. Just to wish him a happy. And then we'll get on with it. Johnny, I've only got two minutes with you. Okay. Congratulations, John Byers. I know. You're a winner. Team today, yep. Your sports show's coming back on the air, and I'm going to fight on Tuesday night to get you on the educational channel before they open the new access station in Medford. Well, that's good news. I mean, come on. I mean, this fight's been going on for a long time here in Medford, and it finally took the mayor to grow a set. So no, no, no. The mayor didn't do this, John. What happened was, you know, on, on October 8th, there's going to be a, an, an arraignment of one of the former board members of TV3. That's all I'm going to say. That, that we know, and, and that's another thing, too. Because of that, it forced his hand. It forced, no, it forced TV3's hand, and the mayor is going to take credit for them shutting down on their own. They shut down on their own. Right. Okay? The mayor had nothing to do with this. They shut down on their own. He's getting all the assets of the station. So now we have an access station, John, and you and I are going to be at the, at the forefront with the now city the council. Now, the thing to do is we've got to get a group together to come in, get that access station. Well, let's not even talk, go there yet, because oh. let's just say no, things are happening. Now, someone said to me today that um, a certain individual on Tuesday might start singing like a canary. Did you think of that? I haven't thought of that. No, I don't know. We'll have to talk. We'll about have to tonight. find out about that. But we, let's not let's not explore that. Let's not uh, mention we'll any names. Later on tonight in our private conversations. Yeah, but there might be canaries in the air. Well, yeah. Hovering you, over Somerville. I've been saying to you, and this is this isn't private because we. No said, names, no names, please. A couple of people. We said. Once the first domino falls, every domino will fall after that. And this first domino fall fell and it was a big domino. And now the big domino falls and every domino after that is starting to fall. And, and, and you know what? You can thank Uncle Gene yes. and, uh, and Council President 
Yes. And now the former president. So that's three for three, Johnny. I think we're doing good. Yeah, we're doing great. Uh, I got to talk to Robert Elder now, so you have a good night. And I'll talk to you later tonight, my friend. Congratulations. Bye. Right, yep. And that's Johnny Byers, our sports host, who is thrilled because he just loves being on in Medford, and he's going to be back. And we're going to fight for him to be on the educational channel before before the new access station is built. So this is very exciting. It's we love public access. We all love public access. <laughs> It's all about community. Rob Elder. Robert Elder, I am very honored to be speaking with you tonight. Hey, thanks for calling. Great book. Oh, thank you, thank you. The best film you've never seen. Now, I'm a movie buff. I'm in the middle of reviewing the book mm -hmm. for TMR Zoo. Cool. Being a movie buff, I'm just attracted to this, but this is a book for everyone. Oh, well, hopefully, hopefully. I mean, we have everything from, you know, sort of uh, noir film to B-movies to, you know, obscure French films. So hopefully, yes. And, and what a book like this does is it turns people on to forgotten movies. Yeah, and, and not only that, but not just forgotten movies, but movies that didn't get a chance, like that people sort of actually didn't like the first time around. Um, so I talked to 35 directors. I said, tell me about these films that are close to your heart. Um, that other people, you know, savaged or said bad things about and, you know, helped me write, rewrite film history. It, it, it's a fascinating idea. Uh, your book before this got a lot of notoriety. It was along the same lines, correct? Um, it, it's sort of a sister book. It, it's actually called um, uh, The Film That Changed My Life, and that is sort of directors telling me a story about the film that they saw that made them want to become a director. So they're not exactly the same kind of book, but they're, they're related. Okay, can I throw one at you that's not in your book? Oh, tell me. Mick Jagger's performance. Performance? Yeah, you know, I have not. You're, you're ahead of me. I haven't seen that. Uh, t tell me about it. Dare I tell you, I saw it in like 72. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And it was in my like top five films along with Bride of Frankenstein. Dare I tell you that? But uh, it, it, it truly is uh, an interesting underground movie, and there's a soundtrack that has the great song Memo from Turner with Jagger singing. So uh, the soundtrack is really worth getting because it can enlighten you. If, in fact, maybe if you hear the soundtrack first, then watch the movie, you'll see why I rave about it. Okay, okay, I, I will put that on my list. So the one thing that... Uh, I really enjoy about this book and talking about this book is it's just a chance to talk with folks like you and friends, and it, it, it's like playing deep cuts on records. You know, it's like you know we're trying to sort of turn our love of film over to other folks. What we do here, Robert, we'll get into the book in a second. But at the uh, quarter of hour, we call Frank Delastrito down in Houston, who's the author of Bela Lugosi uh, Vampire, uh, Vampire over London, Bela Lugosi in Britain. And every, for now, for like two and a half years, we've been talking about the public domain movies we ha air here on Friday nights. Oh, great. So we've got this whole catalog of films, much like what you talk about, because some of them got lost in the shuffle. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, you know, a few of them are, are public domain, you know, people forget, um, uh, you know, and also people forget that, uh, you know, It's a Wonderful Life was in the public domain. I mean, that's why it's the hit it is, because when it came out, it was not a hit. In fact, it lost money. And the reason you saw it every Christmas was because it was cheap for everybody to play. So now it's, you know, recognizes the classic it is because it's so ingrained in our culture. Isn't that so odd, though, that uh, something majestic like that has to not succeed in order to succeed? Well, I mean, it, it was a darker sort of Christmas movie, I think, than people were used to. You know, it was, first, it was uh, Jimmy Stewart's first uh, role after uh, World War II, and I think... Uh, that also made him a, a slightly darker performer. So, you know, it, 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 if you look at it, there's nothing that says Christmas blockbuster on it. Right. Um, did you sit down and meet with all these directors face to face? Uh, it was a mix. Some were in, you know, in person, some were in phone, some were over dinner. Um, you know, it, it, was, it took me about nine years uh, in total to get 35 directors together. So it, it, just really, it just really depended. It was like a giant game of telephone. Fascinating. So when you're having dinner with one of these great directors, um, things certainly digress from the book. Did you get any insight into their artistry outside of what they wrote in your book? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean that's actually a lot of that still makes it in the book. You know, like I, I'm I'm able to talk to you know Danny Boyle 
about, um, you know, how he wants to die, you know? <laughs> um, uh, Michel Gondry, in my previous book, you know, he talks about uh, this, this film that changed his life as sort of a uh, sequel to the, to the Red Balloon. Um, and, uh, you know, many people know that that uh, director, uh, you know, died in Iran. You know, he, I think he fell, uh, died in a helicopter crash, and he's like, you know what, I want it to be a very long way from now, but, you know, I, I, I want to die on set. Uh, so you get all these interesting insights, and you end up, I think, in some of the conversations, learning more about the directors than you do about the films. Um, but that's part of uh, why I love doing it so much. You know, what's interesting is um, the, um, and I don't say his name right, Guillermo del Toro? Close enough, yeah, Guillermo del Toro. Yeah, uh, you, you, he's chapter three, and as I've got your book, he comes on NPR promoting the uh, DVD release of Pacific Rim. So it's fascinating to hear the guy's voice as I have your book in reading the chapter, you know? Uh, it's kind of like, and it's a, sec it's a different interview, so you're getting double insight on the guy. Well, and he, he's particularly great because he, he talked to both uh, myself and Terry Gross a little bit about, you know, being raised by his grandmother, who was so protective of him and so Catholic that she was afraid that his... Um, his love of monsters and science fiction and, and uh, you know, fantasy endangered his soul. So, you know, uh, she actually uh, performed an exorcism on him. Whoa. Uh, you know, so he's very funny about that. And, and, you know, he sort of glosses over it. But I, I say, you know, th this is sort of, you know, you know well, this is extraordinary. You know, there, there's one thing to watch The Exorcist, and then there's, you know, it's quite another to be the subject of an exorcism. And he just sort of waves it off and laughs. He's like, well, you know, she... she she was an amateur. She wasn't a pro, you know. So yeah, uh, so you get all these interesting biographical details about you know how our loves um, touch our lives. Uh, the interview I heard on NPR was on point, which is a show done here in Boston mm -hmm. on NPR. So Terry Gross is on the same station, but it was a second interview with him, mm -hmm. which is good. Uh, the more the merrier. Yeah. The other thing is, you know that old saying, "A picture's worth a thousand words." You're centerfold with the black and whites. Just Anthony Perkins in the trial makes me want to pull the movie out. I've never seen it. Uh, and watch it. Yeah, I mean, it, it is sort of an unrelentingly grim film, but it's a great adaptation of Franz Kafka's, Franz Kafka's The Trial. Um, uh, and he is great in it, and, you know, uh, it's an Orson Welles film. Um, and actually, in uh, This Is Orson Welles, which is this great book um, in which Peter Bogdanovich, you know, it's a dialogue between the two of them. Um, it, it's it's the it's the film that Bogdanovich says basically that he has the most trouble with, and Orson bristles, hmm. um, and and hmm. uh, so you know it's it's really interesting to sort of see this film get its due because it also has a more uh, if you if it can be said to be more hopeful, it has a more hopeful ending than the book, and I think one that actually is more fitting. The photo is extraordinary because it's got Tony Perkins with two paintings. Mm -hmm. It looks like a post office. Uh, I'm not sure. And then there's these white, the white ceiling panels with the black lines. Just an extraordinary eight and a half uh, uh, black and white film photo. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's all Wells' composition. It's amazing. It, it, it really is. And then you've got uh, Herbert Marshall and Miriam Hopkins, uh, Trouble in Paradise. Another wonderful photo that kind of just draws you in. Yeah, and, and finding these, you know, it, it wasn't easy. You know, some of these films... Again, we're not blockbusters, um, so not many people save stills of them, uh, but the, the lovely folks at uh, Indiana University helped me track them down. Some of them actually came from Pauline Kael's collection because she saved a whole bunch of uh, press kits, so uh, I am yet again indebted to Pauline. Now, um, a film that I have trouble with is Joe versus the Volcano. Okay, and why do you have a trouble? Uh, you know, I liked it when I saw it, and now in retrospect I feel, man, that was just too silly. <laughs> it, it is silly, and I, I have problems with the way it ends, but it is such sort of this weird, enigmatic, kind of wannabe Tim Burton kind of comedy, early Tim Burton. Um, you know, Meg Ryan plays three different roles, and it's the first uh, film where it's Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks together. People forget, you know, that this is the film that sort of lost the, the, launched that sort of weird you know, uh, romantic tension that they had in Sleepless in Seattle and You've Got Mail, which, you know, J. Duplass, who's the director who chooses it, uh, points out that, like, like, they have this comfortable romantic tension. Like, you don't 
ever feel like they they want to devour one another. There's, a, there's it's almost like non-sexual love, but they make such an appealing on-camera couple um, that is interesting to watch that evolve, starting with this movie. So none of the directors brought up Myra Breckenridge, huh? No, and no, I think everybody tried to steer clear. <laughs> really? I th I think well, you know, and who knows? You know, I maybe I'll do another volume and they'll they'll dig it up. But uh, uh, no, uh, no, no, and, and it never came up in any other uh, conversations, interestingly enough. So Under the Volcano is separate from Joe versus the Volcano, but we've got two volcano movies in your book. Yes, two volcano movies, a couple of noir films, uh, a couple of, uh, more than a couple of, uh, of, of flops. Um, and then, you know, even some films that won Oscars. I mean, that, this is my biggest fight with Kevin Smith. Um, is he picked A Man for All Seasons. And I said, uh, Kevin, I, I think that swept the Oscars. I think it was 1963 or 66. I said, it doesn't really qualify. And he said, well, show me anyone under 30 who's seen it. Uh, and in fact, I'm, I'm showing it, uh, I'm going to go on tour um, in the Northwest in the middle of uh, October, and we're going to show it in Eugene, Oregon. And uh, the film programmer hadn't even seen it. So Kevin proves me uh, wrong. Well, and again, I, I certainly know the title being my age, but um, yeah, it, it escaped me. That movie escaped me, and I'm a film buff, and so I have to give him a vote of confidence, too. That is a good one to pull out of the mothballs. Yeah, and it, it's a great film. I, I mean, I don't think anybody remembers it because there are no stars in it, you know? It, it's, it's got the guy who played the captain in Jaws. Like, that's it. it you know, it's the, <laughs> the most recognizable uh, actor, and then you have uh, uh, Paul Schofield, who carries the entire film on this amazing uh, script. And you know, the script is it was originally a play, and I actually love uh, watching it and comparing, you know, uh, his portrayal um, uh, to like the modern day accounts um, in like the Tudors, which you know ran on Showtime, um, and uh, there's even a couple of books uh, that uh, bring up. Uh, uh, you know, the, the Henry VIII the reign uh, uh, again. So I, I love sort of uh, going back through all of that. Um, it is fascinating. Now, it took you um, nine years to do this book. Mm -hmm. Are there outtakes, uh, things that didn't, um, you didn't have room for? Yes, yes. And, and I actually, I, I want them to um, uh, show up in, in uh, future books. So um, <clears throat> uh, Pete Doctor, who directed Up and... Um, uh, uh, Monsters Inc. Uh, he f he uh, chose this uh, Jacques Tati film called Playtime, um, which uh, at the time we talked about it was nowhere to be found. Now it has a very nice DVD release. Mm -hmm. um, and then, am I allowed to swear on this? Uh, um, I'd rather not because we're in the eight o'clock hour. Okay, okay. Well, there is a um, uh, a documentary that Robert Frank directed about the Rolling Stone. Uh, about the Rolling Stones, and the first word is a swear word, but the second word is blues. Um, and uh, uh, Andy Tominer, um, who is a documentarian, sort of picked that as her uh, choice. And uh, so those two sort of hit the cutting room floor, and I, it makes me sort of cringe every time I think about them, but uh, I think they will get a second life somewhere. Did you get the backstory on Blank Blank Blues? Yeah, yeah. You know, Robert Frank, uh, you know, filmed it, The Stones did not want it to sort of see the light of day. In fact, it has this very, very convoluted legal um, uh, baggage that comes with it in that it cannot be screened unless Robert Frank himself is in the room. You know, it's a very, very interesting thing. So the only way you can find this movie is to um, basically find it on the gray market or, you know, there are some places that have it online. So, uh, you know, it's a very, very unusual film um, and kind of distasteful in places, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Andy uh, uh, picked it, and uh, again, I, I, it'll, it'll find a home in a second volume. Well, put it in your book along with performance, maybe. Uh, Perhaps. You know, um, here's a little backstory from me on this. Um, I managed and um, was business partners with the late Jimmy Miller. He produced the Rolling Stones. Oh, yeah. So Jimmy died in 94. So probably around 87, 88, 89, um, it came through town. Mm -hmm. And they had one seat left, and the promoter, because of my affiliation with Jimmy, said, you can have the seat. A lawyer I had at the time begged me for the seat, so I gave it to him. 
because <laughs> I have a gray area version now of it. <laughs> but it's just kind of one of those things. Yeah, it is such an underground. Uh, th that's a whole other avenue for you because that film never got the chance to even have a, a splash. No, no, and, and you can see why. You can see why the Stones and their lawyers wanted to um, bury it. It's, 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 it's an unflattering portrait, not necessarily of them, but of the people around them. Uh, you know, there, there's, a, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a scene that I remember that's particularly distasteful where uh, there's a guy busy, basically uh, negotiating with a prostitute, and it's just like, oh, God, you know, get, get me out of the scene. <laughs> and, you know, it's... Um, mm. But it's art. It's cinema. It's um it is. It is, and it's Robert Frank. You know, people forget that Robert Frank, um, among other things, you know, gave us the book The Americans, this amazing photography book. Um, he has done films. Uh, um, you know, uh, Jack Kerouac loved The Americans, wrote the introduction to it, um, and uh, Frank uh, led a very, very interesting life. Uh, but you know, I think had his heart broken about this particular documentary. Now. Films like that can't be on HBO all the time. Maybe they can, but for, for whatever reason, you know, the Stones or whatever, sure. it's not going to happen. Right. Um, maybe that's why Man for All Seasons, because I really like the convenience of cable TV, mm -hmm. where with my, you know, with zillions of DVDs and, and the ability to download, it's still more convenient to be on the couch and just surf. Right, right. So I don't see a Man for All Seasons, so maybe it, it just escaped the cable, uh, you know, venue you know it, it, there's all sorts of reasons i mean um for example uh for a certain generation um uh, you know joe versus the volcano i think played in a loop on tbs for years um you know it was it was sort of hard not to see but then you come across something like the super cops which edgar wright championed it's this uh, amazing gordon parks film um you know and i think part of the problem was it was a uh, a film, and I forget the studio, uh, maybe it's Paramount, but, um, but the cops in it are called Batman and Robin. So there's this weird, almost like rights issue, you know? <laughs> so things are lost for all sorts of reasons. It is fascinating. Now, there was a, a site on the web. Uh, one site on the web had your Gayamo interview in its entirety. I forget which site. I don't know. We, we, we let... Uh Someone excerpted it. Maybe it was Robert e Roger Ebert.com. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and it was fascinating. There it is again on the web, and I liked that, that you could actually read a chapter of your book on the web. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we try to get it out there so people will uh, be curious enough to read the rest of the book. So another site had a movie I really, uh, I really, really like, which is called City Hall. Yeah. John Cusack. And but would you consider that a best film you've never seen, or is that in the mainstream enough? I think that's pretty mainstream. It has Pacino and Danny Aiello, uh, and as you say, Cusack. I think it's got some other heavy hitters in it. Um, uh, but Fonda, I think. Uh, Bridget Fonda, maybe. Perhaps, perhaps. But I, I mean, I don't think it matters who's in it, though. Um, I think, like, for, for example, I love this film with Donald Sutherland uh, in it and William H. Macy called Panic. And, like, I think myself and maybe Roger Ebert saw it. Like, no one else uh, ever saw it. Is directed by uh, Henry Brumell, who uh, recently just passed away, and he was best known as a director of uh, Homicide. Uh, but it is this amazing film about a hitman and his relationship with his father, who is also a hitman, and his young son. Uh, so I always recommend that uh, because I, I think it's a masterpiece that no one has seen. Now, with all these interviews under your belt and all these people talking about movies, you as a writer, do you get the feeling you want to do a book on your own about your favorite 35 best films people have never seen? I don't know. I, I mean, perhaps, but there's also sort of, uh, like, who wants to read that? You know, wh who is the market for that? I think these directors are far more fascinating than I could be uh, about, you know, uh, about unseen films. I, I think the fact that they love them and they bring so much of themselves to the book, I think that is far more interesting than anything I could bring. Now, after you did the interviews, was there any film that you were turned on to that you really like and that you wouldn't have if you didn't write this book? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple of them. Um, I mean, uh, certainly uh, uh, Peter Bogdanovich uh, turned me on to Trouble in Paradise, which is an Ernst Lubitsch film um, and is just an, you know, a classic, period. It's just an unadulterated classic, and everybody should see it. Um, uh, Sean Durkin... 
Um, uh, he directed me to uh, a place called Ten Rillington Place, uh, a movie called Ten Rillington Place, which is about um, a, a serial killer. It's a real story in which Richard Attenborough plays the serial killer. Uh, and Sean directed um, Martha, Marcy May, Marlene. Um, let me see. There's something else here. Um, and also there's just like weird sort of guilty pleasures. Um, like, for example, um, uh, Jonathan Levine, who did 50-50 and Warm Bodies, uh, his choice was Can't Stop the Music, which, uh, if you know, depending on your depth of film knowledge, it was one of the first films, uh, I think it's tied with Xanadu, to get the Razzie. You know, uh, for the first Razzie, it's the Village People musical. Mm -hmm. um, and it is sort of terrible in all the ways you might think, but also sort of this amazing you know, document of a time and a place and of a band that is struggling for relevancy. Um, you know, it's 1980 by the time it comes out. Disco is uh, virtually over. Um, the, 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 the main sort of vocalist has left. In fact, the guy who sings YMCA, he has left the band. Um, but it's really interesting to watch this uh, movie with Bruce Jenner and Steve Gutenberg. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of joy in this sort of wreck of a musical. Now, um, chapter 30, you've got Peter Bogdanovich, uh, Trouble in Paradise. Right. And, you know, Last Picture Show was, you know, made him a really um, famous movie. But Targets got lost in the shuffle, so Targets is actually one of these type of movies. It we is, it is. I, I think because Bob came, you know, a tour, I think people you know, love uh, uh, Paper Moon and What's Up Doc and, you know, even, you know, Mask. He, he's had this uh, amazing, great career, and I think because of that, people sort of reach back and find his his other uh, films. But uh, yeah, Target uh, is a really, really great film, and I love it uh, not only for just his directing, uh, and I believe that it was a Roger Corman film, uh, but also like it's really of a time and a place. It's about a sniper who posi who positions himself inside a, a drive-in theater movie screen. Uh, you know, and uh, where are there even drive-in movie theaters anymore? But for a horror film fan like myself, um, Boris Karloff. Yeah. You know, uh, having, and it was like one of his final movies, wasn't it? Yeah, I think he was under contract. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was very much like an Ed Wood situation where, uh, you know, I think he was, uh, you know, supposed to do a film and, Peter just said, listen, I just want you to play you, basically. Uh, and he's so good in it. Um, and you see him without makeup, unvarnished. It's a very, very strong performance, and I'm glad he got to give it before he passed away. Karloff and Lugosi are, are two actors that really uh, deserve a lot more credit because they were brilliant, in my opinion. Yeah, 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 I mean, and again, because they were, you know, under a ton of makeup, um, and they were from a different time, perhaps uh, the patina of that is not very fair to them, and we're not allowed to sort of see them as they were. Now, how did you interview Arthur Hiller? Arthur Hiller, um, I have had sort of a cinematic crush on for years. Um, Arthur uh, directed one of my favorite films of all time, which is The Americanization of Emily, with um, James Garner and Julie Andrews and James Coburn. Uh, so I just tracked him down. He's got an office, you know, he's got the same secretary he's had for 30 years. Um, and uh, he directed uh, not only The American Station of Emily, but The Silver Streak and a bunch of films that I love. So I just called him up and asked if he wanted to chat. Oh, very cool. Yeah. So he was one of your heroes. Um, did you get a lot of insight that you needed? Yeah, I mean, he, he is uh, a, he's a guy from a different era. You know, he came from directing television. Um, and so just understanding... Um, you know, what his point of view was, and he picked, um, you know, this really long version of The Iceman Cometh with uh, Lee Marvin in it, um, and uh, it, it's uh, uh, this 1973 version, uh, Kino International just put it out a few years ago again, but, you know, it's Eugene O'Neill uh, play that is really, really difficult, and to see it um, done by um, Lee Marvin, uh, again, it's a, sort of a marvel. You know, when you've got stacks of things to review, it, it's hard to know all the movies that are out there or, or, or all the, the media. It's just ridiculous these days. Mm -hmm. Institute Benjamenta, I would never have ever have heard about without your book. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, it is the live-action film. It's the first live-action film by the Brothers Quay, and I think most people um, have seen the Brothers Quay's work, if they haven't even heard of them, you know, Street of Crocodiles. Uh, they do that sort of uh, uh, weird stop-motion animation. Uh, uh, Frida, um, they have that whole section in Frida, um, I think is uh, pretty well known. But, yeah, this is a very uh, challenging film um, about a school for butlers, and it's very dreamlike, and, um, yeah, I also would not have heard it uh, <laughs> if, uh, you know, someone hadn't brought it to my attention. And the director who talks about it is a twin himself, and the Quay brothers are twin brothers. Right, right. So Michael Polish, uh, part of the Polish brothers, he did uh, Twin Falls, Idaho, and uh, North Fork, where we're both Montanans. So we both we both ah. sort of bonded over that, um, but uh, yeah. So that brings sort of an extra layer of insight. Fascinating. So um, you were you were born where? Montana, Billings, Montana. And where are you now? Uh, I live in Chicago. Oh, okay. So um, Montana is a lot different from Chicago. A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you meet Roger Ebert? Yeah, I mean, I was a critic at the Chicago Tribune, so I sat in the same uh, screen room with him for five years. Ah, figured. Um, that's very cool. So he, he was, he was uh, a lot of fun on TV. He was. He was, he was. he was a lot of fun in person as well. Um, and, you know, just sort of uh, observing him uh, uh, in the way he dealt with people and the way he, um, you know, he, he was so prolific um, and always, again, very kind to me. Um, even, uh, you know, a few weeks before his, his death, he wrote me this just uh, amazing blurb for the book, and, uh, you know, uh, I, it's one more thing that I owe him. Well, that's amazing, and, you know, um, that just gives the, the book a little bit more of a luster for those of us who liked Mr. Ebert. Yeah, 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 no, he was, uh, again, qu quite a, uh, a film mind. Now, do you uh, dabble in making movies, or do you make movies? No, no, I don't. Uh, uh, you know, there might be like student films out there, but uh, no, at a certain point, you know, I just had to choose journalism or film, and uh, I chose journalism. Interesting. Now, these films are all American movies, correct? No, no, there's some, um, you know, there's a French film in there, there's... I knew that. That was a dumb question. Sorry. Uh, that's all right, that's all right. No, no, uh, I, I tried to uh, cast a wide net. Right, and, and, and where I was going with the question was, there's so much media these days, um, like you go on YouTube, and those of us who love Dracula with Lugosi, there's the Spanish version of Dracula, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which they filmed at the same exact moment in time. Huh. Um, uh, there must be a lot of Bollywood movies and stuff that would just really miss the mainstream that um, some of these directors probably uh, find and love and... I wonder if that stuff will surface in future volumes of your books if you yeah. continue this train of thought. Yeah, yeah, well, and there's, there's actually a Bollywood film in the first book, uh, the film that changed my life, uh, Garunda Chaha, who directed uh, Bend It Like Beckham and um, uh, a whole bunch of other uh, great films. She chose this film uh, called uh, Sometimes East, Sometimes West um, that is, you know, uh, become this sort of cult film. Um, and I think... Bollywood, again, is underappreciated by American audiences. Um, you know, I, I saw, I actually reviewed for the Chicago Tribune uh, uh, the film, uh, it's called Kapi Kushi, Kapi Ga, Sometimes Happy, Sometimes Sad. Um, and it basically featured like the Mount Rushmore of great Indian actors, like, you know, two or three generations of great Indian actors. But it was like three and a half hours long, and two of those hours were a flashback. Whoa. <laughs> it, it's, they make epic films. And they, their films are also um, melodramas. And I don't think for the American sensibilities uh, that modern Americans have the patience for melodrama. So I think that's one of the cultural barriers. You know, the, the fascinating thing about um, that Bollywood exists, and we have this information superhighway that is cable TV. I, I don't understand why there's not a Bollywood channel. And maybe having a fellow like you come on and talk a little bit about uh, and, and different critics from around the country. To me, it's just if you have the superhighway, put the material out there because I bet there's a big audience just waiting to see something different. Yeah, I'm sure that exists somewhere. I mean, I haven't seen it on my cable package, but, you know, there are enough people out there who are knowledgeable. 
uh, not only native critics, but folks uh, like uh, David Shute, who's a critic in L.A. who's written extensively about Bollywood. Um, you know, there's certainly enough people and there's certainly enough interest for it. But, you know, with all of the cable out there uh, and all the on-demand, the, the one thing that I'm lamenting the loss of is DVD extras. You know, so it's hard to get, uh, you know, because all of the DVD extras have basically gone to Blu-ray now. And so if you want to listen to a worthwhile, you know, uh, commentary track or worthwhile documentary, you know, you have a very narrow way to see it now. Whereas before, you know, almost every DVD came with it. But with On Demand, there's not even that option. So I hope that opens up. I think I just picked up my fifth version of Terminator 2 because the Blu-ray has so much more on it. Yes. Yeah. And what did Cameron say? I think James Cameron said, uh, we're now selling the donut holes. Yes, yes, it's, it, it, it's, it's right. You know, it's the same thing with the, the Beatles. You know, they talked about when they released the anthology, you know, if they released anything else, it would be called, you know, scraping the bottom of the barrel. But then you hear about this, like, amazing 12-minute uh, song that they did that is, you know, yet unreleased. So, uh, you know, part of it is just commerce. They, they put out new editions because they can. The Beatles are very stingy. They have a lot more... Uh, I was over a, a uh, engineer's house in Connecticut on Tuesday. Um, Alan Bershaw, he writes the um, Wolfgang's Vault. You ever see that on the web? No, no, tell me. Wolfgang's Vault is Bill Graham, the, the late concert promoter. Oh, it's all his tapes. All his tapes, but now a lot of other people's tapes. So the engineer that they had purchased a lot of tapes from, uh, Stuart Dinky Dawson, a friend of mine, uh, we drove down to Connecticut to see Bershaw. Uh, he, Bershaw is the archivist for Jewel. The singer Jewel? Yeah. So he, he's been with Jewel from before she was famous, and he's got just these archives that are amazing. But sitting there is this huge box set on the complete Beatles BBC sessions. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are, like, piles of stuff that the Beatles uh, are letting this stuff out very slowly. Um, and, you know, and, I mean, it also fed the, the bootleg market for years because, you know, I'm a Led Zeppelin fan, so every place I went to, I went to every, you know, head shop to see if, you know, I could find, you know, Bonzo, Bonzo's birthday party or, you know, all of the other sort of famous bootlegs that I think once, you know, Led Zeppelin um, gets to that point is they'll start releasing that stuff because the, they have to have the master somewhere. Do you have live on Blueberry Hill? Somewhere, probably. I mean, it's been a, it's been a while. I've been trying to get it all into my iTunes, but I, but I think my, my computer is, is sputtering, so I've got to get a better uh, backup drive. Can we talk about Led Zeppelin for two minutes? Sure. I got some stories for you. Great. So Jojo Lane was married to Denny Lane from Paul McCartney's band. Okay. Jimmy Miller and I were producing her. She's a, she was a dear friend of mine. We lost her in 2006. Mm. So um, her ex-husband, Denny, was dating Helen Grant, the daughter of Peter Grant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she's staying at my house, Helen Grant, Denny Lane, and their child, you know, mm -hmm. who's probably now like, this was 1986. And is, is Peter around still at this time? No, Peter died. Okay. But he was alive at the time, right? Okay. Oh, you know he's dead now, but, but at okay. the time, yes, he was alive. Yeah. So the phone rings, and I pick it up, and hi, this is Peter Grant. Can I talk to Helen? Mm -hmm. I said, Mr. Grant, pardon me for being unprofessional, but this is such an honor. He goes, really? I said, Mr. Grant, Mr. Grant this is an honor. I'll go get Helen. <laughs> I, I mean, I couldn't resist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you know, the the the, the you know the dragon of uh, Led Zeppelin, who kept them sort of uh, protected and helped build their myth. But I, I spoke to Peter Grant for all of twenty seconds, and you know, it's a high point of my life. I'm sorry, you know. It's just oh no, no, we we all have those. I I, um, I, I sort of had that with uh, you know, like Stan Lee. Like I, <laughs> I think everybody has that. All right. So in '88, there was the Led Zeppelin reunion at the uh, 40th anniversary of Atlantic Records. That's right. And remember who played drums? Um, was it John Jason Bonham? I think it was Phil Collins. Phil Collins. You're right. It was Phil Collins. Yeah. Okay, so we were there, and there were three backstage passes. First, my lawyer, who I got rid of later, said to me, uh, you can't get tickets to the Atlantic party. And I said, gee, you don't even know who I am. So we got the tickets to the party. But we had the lowest backstage passes, which was like orange. There were three sets of them. Right. One for the bands, then one for the buffet, and we had the buffet package, right? Um, thank you, Atlantic Records. Mm -hmm. So uh, JoJo knew Jimmy Page really well and Robert Plant, and um, they said, can you get us backstage? I said, watch me. So I turned my backstage pass upside down, mm -hmm. had it hanging out of my pocket, so you knew it was a backstage pass, you didn't know which color. 
I marched towards the Led Zeppelin dressing room. My lawyer, Jojo, seven people, even some people that we met, seven or eight of us walked right up, and Jojo walks right up to Robert. Robert, how are you? It was so much fun. <laughs> so this is my Led Zeppelin stories for you. That's great. That's great. No, I, again, I, I am uh, uh, such a big fan, and I, I love that, that double disc, uh, you know, that uh, uh, How the West Was Won. You know? uh, they truly were a great live band. I think they were sort of better live than they were in the studio, and I, I just uh, hope in the years to come, you know, they let some of that stuff roll out. Did you see them live? No, 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 I'm, I'm too young. Okay, I saw them in 73 at the Boston Garden. And uh, when they came out and did rock and roll, it was like a chainsaw, so you didn't know the song they were playing until the plant started singing. <laughs> it was a huge chainsaw. Huh. And then uh, they were supposed to come back to Boston in 78, and we had to go into the garden to wait for tickets the next morning. Huh. They let us into the Boston Garden, and some of the vandals just destroyed the place. The show was canceled, so I've only seen the band twice, only once with John Bonham. Well, again, uh, you're lucky. You're ahead of most of us. It was fun, but thank you let me, for letting me indulge in my uh, Zeppelin fun. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm a big fan. I'm happy to hear it. Uh, I'm a fan of your book, Robert, and, you know, if you ever come to the Boston area, we'd love to have you on the show oh, in yeah. person. Well, well ask me any time. You know, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm touring on this for the next year, and I'm, I'm hoping to set up screenings on the East Coast. So I have four uh, in the Northwest in October, um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I hope to set some up uh, next year on the East Coast. Oh, cool. We'd love to have you in studio, and I'll stay in touch with Megan on that. Great. Hey, man, um, if you have anything else to offer our audience? No, no, that's it. Uh, again, uh, if, uh, if anybody's interested, you can find uh, stills uh, from the films and quotes from the book um, at um, uh, bestfilm, you've, uh, bestfilmneverseen.com. It's a Tumblr account, um, and uh, it's a lot of fun. I just encourage people to share their, their love of film. Best film never seen. Dot com. com. Okay, and you can put that in Google too. Best film never seen. Com and or, or, or my name again, Robert Elder. I'm, I'm hard to avoid at a certain point. Super, Robert. Thank you so much for your time, man. Hey, thanks again for having me. All right, bye. Bye, bye. Robert K. Elder, what a cool guy. What a nice interview. And after all these years, you know what I should have done during that interview was I should have um, pulled Della Strito's number up. Can you believe I still, in the old days. I used to remember every number, and I should know this number by heart, right? I dial it every single week. See, I'm not dialing it during the day. That's the key. So once a week, after two and a half years, I still, well, you know, maybe in five years we'll get it down. Um, Frank Delstrino talking about movies. Frank, I just talked to Robert K. Elder, the best film you've never seen. Uh, what a great book. Okay, and what is the best film I've never seen? Well, 35 directors champion the forgotten or critically savaged movies they love. All right. So you've got uh, Phil Lord on the Beaver Trilogy. Uh, you've got Richard Kelly on Fearless. You've got Jay Duplass on Joe vs. the Volcano. Now, Duplass... Um, was involved with Cyrus and Jeff, who lives at home, in the puffy chair. So he gets directors to talk about, you know, this was John Patrick Shamley's movie, uh, Joe vs. the Volcano. Mm -hmm. Not one of my favorite flicks, but um, it's that director's, one of his forgotten classics. So what would Frank Delastrito's um, best film you've never seen be? Let's see. Uh, an overlooked horror movie from the 1930s, which I think is the best horror movie of the 1930s, is Island of Lost Souls. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I hang out with the horror movie crowd, so they've all seen it, but when I mention it to most people who aren't horror movie people, they don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, he brought up A Man for All Seasons, and he didn't want the director to discuss it, and the director said, no one over under 30 knows the film. And the, uh. the, uh, the editor of the book said, you know, I was like, noting that uh, he was right. Yeah, no, uh, let's see, well, I, I haven't seen Man From All Seasons. When did it come out? About 19, late 1960s, is that it? I would say. Yeah, uh, I haven't seen it since then. You, uh, now that you mentioned it, I, don't, I, don't, I can't remember the last time I've seen it on one of the, the, movie, the cable movie channels. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot. Of, well, 
Yeah, I mean, movies 40 year, years old. Uh, kids today haven't seen them. Haven't seen a lot of them because they just haven't had the opportunity. They don't, well, they, they, a lot of these movies go in the vaults, never come out. As I noted to Elder, um, I'm a cable buff, so when you don't see them on cable, they inadvertently become forgotten classics. Classics. There's a movie I liked very much. I, I've only seen it once in the movies, Silent Partner with Christopher Plummer and Elliot Gould. And I thought it was one of the best uh, thrillers I'd seen ever. And I don't know, I don't think one person in a thousand knows what I'm talking about when I bring it up. That would have been around ninth, late 1970s, 1980, something like that. So yeah, I, I guess you could, uh, if, you can, if you can get out of your group, tend to, see, tend to see the movies you've seen and try to appreciate what the general movie-going public has the opportunity to see and then what, the opportunity, what they haven't had the opportunity to see. I guess you could write a book like that. I know about Joe and the Volcano. I've never seen it. Uh, you, you, you know, you can watch it at home maybe, but it's, it's really, it's hit or miss. Well, I know it didn't get great reviews, but I, I, I'd never seen it, so I can't comment on it. I found it interesting at the movies. I found it curious. Uh, but like I told the author um, years later, I think, hmm, ridiculous. Yeah. But um, it's October, and I have in front of me Vampire Over London. You're a great man. I am. Reading a great book. <laughs> well, I'm not reading it. I'm just using it as a decor. Okay, very good. And, I, you know, I have to um, be up on my authors when they call in. And you're part of the furniture here. Okay. Uh, take that as a compliment. I, I will. I've seen your furniture. I'm quite impressed. Okay. So now, what I'm going to uh, say is that Frank and I are going to start picking some movies after this week's movie, which tomorrow is Rock, Rocket XM. Is I'm, am I correct? Rocket Ship XM. Rocket Ship XM. And then next week, we've got Dementia 13. Yes. So we'll talk about Dementia 13 next week. And then... You and I should pick a couple for Halloween. I'm going to invite Lugosi on. Okay. Uh, Lugosi, because they've been in touch with me, thanks to uh, you and I talking. Mm -hmm. um, and, oh, I have a woman who did a book on the, the Witches of Salem. But I'm probably not going to have her on the live show. We're probably going to cut a studio show with her. Okay. So uh, we're going to do a lot of Halloween stuff, so you and I can put our thinking caps on. And we could pick the movies for uh, tomorrow is the 4th, Janis Joplin's anniversary. She died 33 years ago uh, tomorrow. 1980. Uh, you, uh, a fellow Texan person. No, 1970, so that would be 43 years ago. Yeah, 43 years ago. I'm getting old. Yeah, I, thought, I thought 1980 sounded that recent, but yeah. 43 years ago, um, a fellow Texan, Janis Joplin, passed away. She was from Austin. Mm -hmm. um, and so we got Rocket Ship XM. So that would be the 4th, and we got the 11th. So then we've got the uh, 18th and the 25th. So we've got two more movies to pick. Maybe Last Man on Earth. Mm -hmm. We have to uh, verify that. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's in the public domain. I love that movie. Do you? Well, you're, you're one of the few that do, but it deserves... The trouble is, it, its weakest part is its first few minutes. If you get through that, it starts picking up fast. But uh, I know the first time I watched it, I said, uh, you know, I kind of lost interest, but then... Uh, Later on, I forced myself to watch the whole thing, and I was glad I did. I think it's terrifying. I think it is the best version of I Am Legend, Richard Matheson's book. Mm. Uh, I like it better. Than, I don't like the uh, Will Smith version. Mm. Will Smith is the Vincent Price of the um, new millennium. You know that. I didn't know that, and I'm not sure I agree. But <laughs> He's in more science fiction movies. My God, I just saw the one with his son, and then he did the uh, Independence Day and I, Robot. Will Smith does more science fiction than anyone. I guess there's box office. Now, I did not see this, the movie with his son. I forget what it was called. How... I, I forget the title. I liked it. The critics panned it. Yeah, I know the critics didn't like it. I've never spoken to anybody. I don't think it did much business because I've never spoken to anybody that's seen it. Uh, I think it'll, it'll make money eventually. It's one of those films that the foreign box office did a little better. So Will Smith might have commanded some you know, box office over there. Uh, who knows? It, it's an interesting movie. I thought some of the critics were unfair, but it, it could have been tighter. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it's, it had a lot along the lines of that Tom Cruise movie. So there's some parallels between that movie and the Tom Cruise movie. Yep. Uh, I, you know that one. Bad, um, I don't remember the name of the Tom Cruise. Both of them. I mean, that, that's how um, disposable they were. <laughs> Big Bucks, disposable film. Okay, well... 
They're, they're out to get the. They're not art. They're not trying for art. They're trying for box office. But I, I, I oh, I'm so embarrassed. I don't remember the names of those movies. Um, next question is: Did we review Rocket Ship XM before? Yeah, we've had it on before, and uh, it's a seminal movie in the sense it's made in nineteen two 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 seminal movies come out in nineteen fifty. Rocket Ship XM is the first comes in June. And Destination Moon is the second, comes out in August. And it was kind of a race between them. And was even, there was almost legal action between the two, which is why in Rocket Ship XM, I'll, I'll give away a little bit of the plot, though yeah, this is only giving away the first few minutes. They're heading towards the moon, but they get diverted to Mars. And uh, something we know would be absurd in today's space program. <laughs> but uh, they, pull, they pulled it off then. But name a science fiction movie before 1950, and you're hard-pressed. I mean, you can come up with a couple of them, you think about it, but, but it really starts with 1915. It's really these two films, which both do pretty well at the box office. They're, they're both uh, modest budget. Rocket Ship XM is more modest than Destination Moon. And, uh, but they do, they do well enough at a box office, and then 1951, a year later, is a big explosion. Day of the Earth stood still. The Thing are big hits, and they really, really makes the science fiction genre take root. But it starts here. And again, it was made. It was made on the cheap. Uh, it's written, produced, and directed by Kurt Newman, a man who had been uh, in Hollywood most of his life. Though so you'd be hard pressed to name movies that he made. He made The Fly in 1958, which is another low-budget movie that really took off. And uh, he, this movie benefits from the, some of his mostly unknowns in this movie, but two of them, Lloyd Bridges. And Hugh O'Brien became big TV star as a, a ten years later, and I, again that's probably something younger viewers today say Lloyd Bridges who and say well he's Jeff Bridges' father oh yeah but you know Lloyd Bridges did a lot of work and he was a a big TV star, and Hugh O'Brien uh, made a fortune playing uh, Wyatt Earp on television for five or six seasons in the late 1950s, and then after that he worked when he felt like it because he had he had made his money and he. Uh, He's very selective at roles. So, uh, the, the, the bad news is you don't see him much after that, So, uh, especially in movies. The last movie of his I can recall is Twins with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and Danny DeVito. He's, he plays uh, he plays a, a, a sperm donor who is Schwarzenegger's father. When you get him on screen and get the camera angles just right, you can see a family resemblance. Hugh O'Brien? Hugh O'Brien. Well, I, I'm saying get them on screen. Do the do the makeup and camera angles just right, and, and you can see a family resemblance. <laughs> no, but it was Hugh O'Brien from this movie. Yeah, Hugh O'Brien. That, that's amazing. Uh, no, no, I mean you were, No, in in Twins, there's a scene with uh, between Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, Hugh O'Brien, and the way they I give them credit the way they filmed it, you would have thought they were father and son just by their profiles. Now I'm, now, I'm sure the makeup and the camera angles and lighting did everything they could to accentuate that, but they pulled it off. But Lloyd was probably gone, so you couldn't get Bo Bridges and Lloyd Bridges together. I, I uh, well, Lloyd is gone. Uh, you, you, Brian's still with us. Lloyd uh, died in 1998. He, yeah, uh, before he, Twins. He in, I think he, uh, he appeared in two uh, Seinfeld episodes, and then he died right after. And there's actually a Seinfeld episode that is dedicated to him because he died right after he made he, he worked with Seinfeld. Oh, and, that's uh, amazing like, stuff. Seinfeld. Excuse me. Amazing stuff. Yeah, uh, but the actor who, who is the scene stealer in this, uh, is the head of the expedition. His name is John Emery, and he has such a distinctive voice and such a distinctive profile that whenever he speaks, you, your eyes tend to look at him. And the role I'll always remember him in is he played the devil in an episode of Thriller called The, the, the Devil's Ticket. And he, he made a dynamite devil, and that was a role I wish he could have played more often. But he's the head of the expedition here, and uh, he's, he's, he's rather a, a dominant figure, but he had no, he had no choice. He's just a, 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 that voice is a one in a million. You just go right to it. In fact, his profile and his voice was so distinctive, there was always a rumor that he was John Barrymore's illegitimate son. It seems that rumor has no, no foundation other than the fact that he had a voice like Barrymore and he had a profile like Barrymore. And Mia Farrow's oldest kid is now being linked to Frank Sinatra. Have you read that? I have not read that. Uh, so he's not Woody Allen's kid. He's Frank's kid. Can he sing? Uh, he, he's a good-looking guy, and uh, he does not look anything like Woody Allen. And on that note, we're off to uh, Dementia 13 next week. 
Okay, I'll speak to you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks, Frank. Bye. Frank Delestrito, author of Vampire Over London, Robert K. Elder, author of, and this is a long one, The Best Films You've Never Seen, 35 Directors Champion, The Forgotten, and Critically Savage Movies They Love. It is Wincam. Thank you, Wincam. Views and opinions of mine, no one else's, uh, except for my guests. Have a great day, and we'll be back. Reeling is on next. Reeling, reeling, reeling in the years.